From John chapter 2, hear the word of the Lord. The Passover, let me try that again. The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Detroit, <laughs> Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Before I ask you to pray with me, I'm just going <laughs> to... Okay, will you pray with me? As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, even when it's too much, to water the earth, to make a bring forth and sprout, to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. May your word be that goes from my mouth now, O Lord. May it not return to you empty, but accomplish that which you purpose and succeed in the thing for which you send it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're looking at our Old Testament lesson this morning. Uh, this covenant that God makes with Moses and the Israelites out in the wilderness, the Ten Commandments. Uh, the question I have is, why this new covenant? Why yet another covenant? During Lent, we've been looking at the Old Testament lessons and all these stories of covenants that God has made, first with Noah and then with Abraham and now with Moses. Why another covenant? Why this new covenant? I get the first one, the one that God made with Noah and all of creation. Uh, all of creation and all of humanity had become evil and so God wanted to do over. God wanted to start all over, wipe the slate clean and for 40 days and 40 nights God flooded the earth to drown every living thing to start all over except that God uh, allowed Noah and his three sons and their wives and two of every kind of animal, every creature to go on the ark to reprocreate the earth after it was all done. The thing is, I, I think probably after observing all these animals, including the humans, on this boat for 40 days and 40 nights, God realized, eh, it isn't going to work. <laughs> You're dealing with a fallen humanity and creation, and it's just a matter of time before we're in the same old boat again, right? <laughs> but up, uh, uh, same old boat again. Tough crowd this morning. Anyway, I... Uh, so, so God put a rainbow in the sky to say, never again will I do this. There's got to be a different way. And the rainbow in the sky was a sign to God that as God continues to seek justice and punish evil, which God will continue to do, nevertheless to have mercy, that the justice has to be tempered with some mercy. And so God puts the rainbow in the sky as a reminder to God. Now, I get that first covenant. I get the temptation on God's part when God wants to say to hell with the world. And I don't mean that flippantly. I mean literally that's what God was saying and doing. To hell with the world. Uh, that when God has that temptation to see that sign and remember the covenant and to say, no, I'm not going to go there. There's got to be mercy. Remember the mercy. And maybe not just a sign to God, maybe it is to us as well. Then when we have that temptation to want to say to hell with the world or to life or whatever, to say, wait, stop. There's got to be mercy. There will be a new dawn. There will be a new day. Remember the mercy. I get the first covenant. I get why 
God made that. I get even the second covenant with Abraham and Sarah. Choosing a particular people to work with. To bless them so that they can be a blessing to the rest of the world. So that people will see what it is to be in relationship with God. I get why God gave them a sign, a covenant of circumcision. Because when they didn't have faith that God would keep God's promises, uh, this was a painful reminder (laughs) that even if you laugh at me, Abraham, Sarah, I am going to keep my promise. You will have a son. You will name him Isaac. Isaac, which means he laughs, and you will see that my word is true. Right? I get those first two covenants, but why now yet another one? Why this one to Moses, the Ten Commandments? Or was it 15? You ever see History of the World Part 2 with Mel Brooks, and he's dressed up as Moses. He's coming down the hill with three, with three tablets, and he says, I present to you the 15 commandments. And he drops one and says, Ten Commandments. <laughs> Anyway, whatever the number, these Ten Commandments, why this new covenant, this new, these Ten Commandments? Don't you think that the people already knew this law? Don't you think that every society, long before Moses ever got these things written down for him, that all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Noah, that they knew you've got to follow these natural laws? You can't kill, you can't steal, you can't cheat. Can't be slandering and gossiping. Uh, Otherwise, we won't have any kind of civil community or society. Doesn't every society know that? Have some sort of natural law in place? As Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, you know the law. Whether it's written down for you or not, we all do. Don't you think? So why the necessity for this? I remember when I was a teenager, it's a long time ago, but I remember... uh, Distinctly, when I got my license, and even well into adulthood, it always just drove me nuts that my mom would always say to me before leaving the house, now drive safe. (laughs) Thinking, seriously, does it have to be said? I mean, what did you think? I was going to go drive recklessly, but now, okay, now that you said it, I remember, okay, now I'll drive safe. (laughs) Just drove me nuts, and now I'm doing it to my own kids. (laughs) But I sit in my office, which is on that side of the building looking at the side street over there, and there's a stop sign to division. And I think, does that really have to be there? I mean, don't I already know that I need to stop before going out onto that street or I'm going to hit someone or I'm going to get hit? Does it have to be said? Now, maybe... There are those who need everything written down, and as long as it's said, then I'll do it. But if it's not, but as soon as it's said, there will be others. Some maybe want everything black and white. Just tell me what's expected, write it down, and then I'll do that. There are others, though, as soon as you write it down, as soon as you put that sign up, are going to say, does that really need to be there? And they start questioning, and they start wondering, was that for a different day and time? You know how many laws are on the books that are obsolete today that still exist? They aren't enforced. Uh, and they were written for a different day and time, but nobody's taken them off the books? Uh, at least that's what it says on the internet. Anyway, <laughs> there are those who will question and there are those who will test. As soon as something is written down and said you cannot, there will be those who say, just watch me. I bet I can. Right? So why? Why do we do it? Is it going to ensure that I stop there? Or will I still just take it as a suggestion and creep up and wait to see if I can actually go and and then I'll go without actually stopping? Now for all of the police officers in the room, this is all theoretical. I'm not (laughs) not saying that's what I actually do or I'm going to do as far as you know. So uh, I'm just saying, does writing it down, does, does having the law actually ensure that we're going to keep it, that we're going to do it? Is it necessary to say it? Why the law? Why this new covenant? Don't we already know it? The thing is, wow, listen to that Sunday school. <laughs> is that a joyous noise or what? That is just awesome. I remember my, fir- my, yeah, my first congregation that I served. I probably told this story before. This has nothing to do with my sermon, by the way. <laughs> I'll put the first one on the internet. But 
In my first congregation, I, just so you know, when we have crying babies, it is music to my ears. I, I know it may be distracting for some, but I love it. My first congregation, they were down to 19 people in a sanctuary that was bigger than this that seated 400 people. And they were ready to close the doors. And uh, the pastor got cancer and a young man in our congregation, the only family that had children in the congregation, uh, the 15-year-old boy got cancer. And the, and the pastor and that boy died one week apart. And my colleague, who I came in to be the associate pastor with, my colleague had been, the, during that interim period, had been ministering to them. And, and, uh, and by the time, uh, after all of that, by the time I came, they were now worshiping over 300 people a week and they needed a second pastor. And for the first time in the history, were calling me as the associate pastor, calling an associate pastor. And the reason that congregation came alive was because that 15-year-old boy, uh, Anytime he could get away from children's on the weekend, he would come home, insist on coming home, and he would lay in the pew during the worship, and when it came time for communion, would come up with his IVs and come forward for communion. And it was the witness of that kid and that congregation around their pastor and this only, you know, only family with children in that congregation and his witness, his faith that resurrected that place. And years later, when they called an associate pastor, if there was ever a child crying in the congregation, there was nobody who was upset about that. It was music to their ears. So to hear our Sunday school downstairs, oh, what a joyous noise. Anyway, I have no idea what I was talking about. We're <laughs> oh yeah, do we need the law? Do we need all of that? Um, you know, sometimes there's a, a sermon within a sermon, and we'll let that go. But maybe God gives this uh, law because these people were just in Egypt and need to kick the dust off their feet. You know? They had been in a place where... Uh, they had been surrounded by a different culture, a different people. And maybe those people knew some of the law, things that everybody knows. You can't steal, you can't cheat, you can't kill. But what about the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods. They didn't know Yahweh. And what it means to be in relationship with Yahweh. And maybe all of these people who have now come out of that culture... And so shaped by that world and that reality have forgotten what it means to be in relationship with God. So maybe sometimes it does need to be spelled out for us. So they come out and God gives them this law as a gift to say this is what it means to be in relationship not just with me but with each other and to be the people of God as a witness to the rest of the world. This is how I want my people to live. This is what I want for the world. I want our children to be able to go to school without fear. I want uh, our citizens to be able to travel freely. I, I want uh, neighbors to be able to sleep at night in peace without fear of their house being broken into. Then maybe even they can leave their doors unlocked. I, I want this for the world. We think that laws and more laws restrict our freedom when without the laws, it seems like we have no freedom. I want that freedom, especially from fear for my people and to live in community and to be a witness to the world. I want you to live this way. Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples, that you are Christians by your love, right? That there's a way of life. There's a way to Christianity. That's what it was called in the beginning. Lori and I were invited as pastor and spouse, uh, and pastors and spouses in the area were invited to a pre-screening of a movie that's coming out March 23rd. Um, in theaters on the Apostle Paul. 
And it's also on the disciple, his disciple Luke, the evangelist. Um, and, and it's worth seeing. I mean, you know, they take some liberties with the story to tell the story. But nevertheless, it's, it's a good movie. It's worth seeing. But what struck me in that was that the, the way of the world was not the way for Christians, right? Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Your mind is set on the ways of the world, not on the ways of God. And as Paul is in prison and then beheaded at the end of the movie and Christians are being fed to the lions and being used as torches to light the streets at night, the natural tendency by some was to want to react and for revenge and there is this insistence upon living the way. And the way being nonviolence and peace, the way being love and not buying into the ways of the world and hatred. There is a way that God wants for the world and for us. It isn't, it's a gift. It isn't intended to be this disciplinarian. It's intended to be this gift. I don't think that this is a departure from the old covenants where God made a promise to Noah and a promise to Abraham, didn't ask anything in return or any expectations. And here, yeah, now there's expectations being raised. But it starts with a promise. I am the Lord your God. I am your God. Regardless of anything else that is said, listen to this. I am your God. I am your God, whether you end up keeping any of these commandments or not. I am your God. I am your God, whether you're going to end up being a witness to the world the way I want you to be or not. I am your God. I am committed to this. I am the Lord your God. Now that covenant was given to the Israelites. But you also have received a covenant in your baptism. A promise where God says, I am your God. You are the sheep of my own fold. You are the lambs of my flock. You are the sinners of my redeeming. You belong to me. You have been clothed in Christ. You have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I am your God. I'll die and go to the depths of hell for you. I am your God. So how do you want to live? How do you want the world to see that you are a Christian and that we are the community of the beloved? This is how I would like for you to live and what I want for the world. 